Birmingham is officially broke. The city council, the largest local authority in Europe, is effectively bankrupt. Slough, where the local council recently declared bankruptcy. In Woking, where just recently the local council issued a section 114 notice, an effective declaration of bankruptcy, racking up an extraordinary £2.4 billion worth of debt. Assets sold, services cut and jobs lost. All because of an unexpected, uncontrollably rapid increase in cost of services and a conservative government hell-bent on cutting funding and running the country on the cheap, all in the name of austerity. But when did this start and why are we in this position now? Some may say this is the fallout from the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Some may say this is a result of the 2020 global pandemic. Others may even say this is remnants of the 2008 global financial crisis. And to those who say that, there is certainly an element of truth. But I think this issue begins to date back even further. Back to a time when Queen Duran Duran and dire straits were rocking the UK music scene and you couldn't turn on your radio system without hearing those guys. That's right. This all starts with the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was the first woman Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and was voted into power in 1979, seen as a competent and safe pair of hands to help steer the UK economy into stability and eventually growth following the lacklustre economic performance of the Labour Party in the 1970s. Despite in the medium term, Thatcher's economic policy looking revolutionary in encouraging economic mobility and helping working class people become middle class. It's safe to say, 45 years on, a lot of Thatcher's economic reform is feeling and looking outdated and is partially to blame for such an intense income inequality issue for the UK. One of the main reforms Thatcher is known for is privatisation. This involved the UK selling off controlling stakes in British Gas, British Telecom, British Aerospace, British Airways, BP, British Steel, Jaguar and other firms would follow. Now at the time, despite this being a somewhat divisive policy, was widely accepted as Thatcher marketed this as a great opportunity to give power back to the people. But 45 years later, it is clear to say that small British shareholders hold little to no influence, unfortunately resulting in both residents and council being held at economic hostage by private foreign firms. Despite Margaret Thatcher's privatisation scheme being an effective way of making a quick profit for the UK Treasury, it's safe to say none of that money is still remaining in the Treasury and leaves local governments and residents at the mercy of profiteering fat cat capitalists willing to squeeze every last drop out each customer. And it's safe to say Margaret Thatcher's business first approach to the economics was on full display with her extensive and initially lucrative privatization schemes. Under Thatcher's oversight local councils also undersaw a significant loss in powers where development corporations and enterprise zones being implemented, all who of course enjoyed a cheeky tax break. Oddly enough for a politician who certainly embodied libertarianism, individualism and freedom, her long-lasting legacy to local government was increasing centralization, which in turn limited and controlled local democracy in England. But I think it's more than safe to say that Thatcher's right to buy scheme has caused far more long-term damage and has single-handedly created a disastrous housing crisis in the UK. This was a scheme brilliantly marketed by the Conservatives and Thatcher. And even though uptake was not immediate, after time lots of former council homes were purchased by people who used to be council tenants. However, akin to many of Thatcher's policies, this scheme did not benefit all and led to those who were seen as low-skilled, unemployed, lone parents or young tenants unable to afford to exercise this right. Despite this, from 1980 to 83, it is estimated the UK government saw a financial windfall of nearly four pounds, billion, from the sales of council homes. This would be around 13 billion pounds in today's money. 
Unfortunately, even though the UK Treasury saw significant financial gain from this scheme, it doesn't entirely solve the problem, as now the councils have sold these homes, they are no longer in possession of them, so now need to go about building new homes. Something that did not happen, and hasn't happened since the 1970s. Now don't get me wrong, the building of council homes did not completely fall off a cliff in 1980. 250,000 council dwellings were constructed between 1980 to 1985, but construction did slow year by year. Laying the foundations for the housing crisis the UK is currently facing, with soaring unaffordable prices as supply is unable to keep up with demand even remotely, resulting in a shark-infested housing market solely reliant upon the private sector. But Thatcher left office in 1990. Surely the politicians over the next 34 years will fix this. We now fast forward to 2008, where Cristiano Ronaldo was terrorizing Premier League defenses. Vocal powerhouse Alexandra Burke went on to win the X Factor, and the UK economy was knee-deep in a global recession. Gordon Brown was at the helm of the UK Parliament during this time as Prime Minister. Gordon Brown and his predecessor Tony Blair, under New Labour, oversaw a vast deregulation in the finance sector. In an attempt to more Americanize our financial markets and hopefully replicate the booming growth that our Atlantic cousins experienced in the early 2000s dot-com bubble. However, similarly to America, this deregulation left the UK financial markets wide open to greediness and manipulation which is exactly what happened. Now, I'm not going to go into the gory details of the 2008 global financial crisis, as that has been done to death and potentially is a topic for another video. But to cut a long story short, the years of propaganda delivered by both government and the private sector that owning a home is an absolute necessity was capitalized upon by greedy bankers and mortgage lenders and these suits would offer irresponsible and unaffordable mortgages to anyone that would be irresponsible enough to take them. Creating what seemed to be a thriving housing market, but what really turned out to be nothing more than a housing bubble, leading to people being unable to pay their mortgages when the interest rates would go up, resulting in people losing their homes and then banks realizing hundreds of billions of pounds worth of losses due to unpaid mortgages and severely inflated house prices. Every UK bank was severely affected by this crisis, as you can imagine. This crisis saw the collapse of the UK largest mortgage lender HBOS, then Northern Rock. And then a government bailout saved the Royal Bank of Scotland. It is said that £137 billion was spent by the UK Treasury to bail out the banks and attempt to stabilise the financial markets. This gigantic financial outlay from the UK government led to very little funding remaining for local government. We even reached out to a local politician to comment on the financial situation they found themselves in 2008 following the crisis. I've got nothing left. I've got nothing left. I've got <laughs> we now enter the era of austerity a period kicked off by an uneasy alliance formed by the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats, a relationship that at first looked to be a potential for an interesting and creative collaborative effort to help the UK recover from the global financial crisis and help steady the ship and avoid more damage. However, this coalition did face some voter pushback as Conservative voters didn't vote for Liberal Democrat policies and vice versa, and did lead to voters feeling the coalition government was weaker and less decisive. But in reality, this was hardly the case when it came to the actual politics, as almost none of the Liberal Democrat policies was adopted by the Conservative Party and left the Liberal Democrats as a political laughing stock, a stigma they still are struggling to recover from to this day. Now, following the 2008 crisis and going into this new era of politics, the main propaganda sent out by government was that it was imperative to cut costs and reduce the deficit. 
Think of the UK as a business that has been losing lots of money and the Conservatives are leech-like hedge fund investors that are taking over the business and are attempting to cut out the fat and make the business a leaner and thus a more profitable business. Using Greece as a cautionary tale of a nation whose irresponsible and uncontrollable spending had obliterated their economy, so much so to the point that Greece still hasn't fully recovered. But as it turns out, the UK economy shouldn't treat its finances the same way a medium-sized enterprise would, or how a small family would. And contrary to what David Cameron and company would have you think at the time, austerity is not good for growth, and an economy that is not growing is not well-placed to reduce its debt. The UK economy going into this era was depressed, and what it needed was a large jumpstart to get it growing again and make a real attempt at paying off the previously accumulated debts. Luckily, the UK wouldn't be able to crash as badly as Greece, as the debts owed by the UK was largely in its own currency. But that didn't stop George Osborne from slashing funding on welfare, social services, and of course, councils, resulting in a sluggish and stagnating economy. In the following years, the UK economy did begin to slowly grow again, as austerity eased. However, this period remains the slowest economic recovery from a crisis the UK has ever experienced. We now explore why Brexit means Brexit, a referendum that will impact the future generations of Britain in ways that are yet to even be foreseen. A campaign built on the back of fear-mongering, nationalism and lies. Brexit was more than just a political campaign. It triggered a culture war that is still bubbling in Britain even today. In addition to this, it single-handedly launched the political career of former UKIP leader Nigel Farage. The result of the Brexit referendum in favour to leave the EU also spelt the end of David Cameron's premiership as Prime Minister and resulted in him being replaced by Britain's second ever female Prime Minister, Theresa May. Similarly to Margaret Thatcher, it seems sentiment around Theresa May at the time of her taking over the Conservative Party was that she would be a safe and steady pair of hands to lead Britain's Brexit negotiations with the EU. Unfortunately, this perception of being a safe pair of hands was quickly called into disrepute and May had her authority and power severely damaged by crisis that was to ensue following her Brexit deal proposals to government. At one point, Theresa May's fellow Conservative MPs felt so outraged by her proposed Brexit policy, they launched a vote of no confidence. Luckily, May won this vote. However, she was far from safe from facing opposition to her leadership as her next proposed Brexit bill was overwhelmingly voted down twice. Sending her back to the drawing board to make one last proposal. We then was able to get a comment from Theresa May regarding if she believed that her third proposal would be accepted by government. Absolutely. Unfortunately for Theresa, her third proposal was rejected by the government, and this ultimately spelt the end for another UK Prime Minister. But in came Boris Johnson, the former Mayor of London, won the general election in 2019 following the resignation of Theresa May and immediately got to work to resolve this major issue and get a Brexit deal over the line. And getting a Brexit deal over the line is exactly what happened. Now, this Brexit deal was agreed by government unlike the previous attempts from Theresa May. But you would be foolish to assume this is necessarily a greatly improved deal from the previous offers and certainly doesn't improve the economic prospects of the UK despite Boris attempting to sell this deal as one that would really benefit the businesses of the UK. This deal really serves nobody and provides nothing but more admin and red tape for the businesses of the UK that want to trade with the EU. But the impact on councils is something that has truly gone under the radar, where most of the media coverage on Brexit has explored the impact on commerce and immigration. The real-time impact of council funding on the back of Brexit 
is truly devastating, resulting in councils no longer having access to the European Structure and Investment Fund, the European Regional Development Fund and the European Social Fund, all funds that historically the Council have made good use of. A prime example being when Cornwall Council secured a £132 million grant of EU funding towards a super-fast broadband project. Another being £7.2 million being secured from the European Social Fund to Hampshire County Council to help create the job deal which focused on getting ex-offenders back to work. Another source of funding to local councils that has been affected by Brexit is foreign direct investment, something that councils and the country as a whole previously have greatly benefited from. As foreign direct investment often will result in greater productivity, increased wages and further employment opportunity. However, Brexit has resulted in the UK being perceived as more isolated and less open to foreign investment and this perception would be reality where European businesses are now susceptible to trade tariffs, leading to these foreign enterprises potentially thinking twice before providing investment to the UK and realizing that potentially an EU member state would be more financially viable due to freedom of movement and free trade. And we have seen this in real time where France has overtaken the UK in terms of attracting foreign investment and Germany is closing the gap also. We caught up with Boris Johnson and managed to ask his opinion on those who didn't like his Brexit deal. Bloody rapscallions! We now fast forward another couple more years and enter the lockdown era. Now, we are not going to explore what lead to lockdown and what caused it, as media propaganda has flooded our screens explaining it for the past four years. However, in terms of council finances to many councils across the country, this was the significant economic event that has led to their financial ruin. The financial straw that broke the camel's back. Leading up to lockdown, Tory governments had cut council spending by a third, despite rising demand for social care and council services. This leading to councils having to use up all of their financial reserves and even begin to cut frontline services. It goes without saying that this nationwide lockdown put an extraordinary amount of pressure on the National Health Service, which similarly to council services is oversubscribed and severely underfunded. And these financial pressures were exasperated for councils due to the previously mentioned government cuts, but also a reduction in income for these councils as businesses weren't operating so were trying to suspend paying their business rates. And those who had to pay business rates but couldn't operate soon found themselves going out of business. In addition to this, people were staying at home, so not accessing facilities like council-run car parks, which is also a source of revenue that was severely diminished during a lockdown. Understandably, the majority of media focus was on central government the economy and the health of the UK population. But just like the 2008 financial crisis and just like Brexit. Councils go under the radar and the silent council funding crisis has been bubbling under the surface for years. And it has taken reduced funding from government, no more access to EU funding, soaring interest rates, global lockdowns and councils literally going bankrupt for the conversation around a lack of council funding to begin. I wanted to finish this video by first saying a huge thank you for watching all the way to the end. I appreciate the video isn't perfect, but took a lot of time and research to produce, and I hope you were entertained and learnt something along the way. And secondly, I wanted to finish this video with some interview clips I got from the Prime Minister, other politicians and even the public. So we will start off with an easy first question for yourself, Mr. Prime Minister. Are you actually good at politics? <laughs> Not really. Maybe. It's classified. Secondly, what is your opinion on the Ukraine-Russia conflict and the war in Israel? 
Two wars. Two right now. war. We're Don't in the say. midst of two wars. Huh. Um, not really an answer to the question, but on to the next. The UK has a growing LGBT community. What would your message to them be? Fact. <laughs> Gay. Maybe, Mr. Prime Minister, you would like a chance to rephrase your answer. I, are you gay? Can I, can I get an answer? Well, no, I'm asking, I'm, this is a part of, are you, are you a gay man? What would your response be to the members of the public who believe your party to be the reason why the economy is so messed up? I never said thank you. And you'll never have to. We are nearly at the end now, Mr. Sunak. What do you like to do in your spare time? And finally, we all know, of course, you are married, but what would your dream partner be? Little Chinese boys from all over the globe 